Well, good morning, everybody. So good to see all of you this morning. Uh, hope you all enjoyed the nice weather yesterday. It was nice and warm for the middle of September day. I was pretty pleased. I know my wife was. She got to spend her first day in the pool yesterday. First day. And she's like, I'm going to do it. And it was beautiful. It was a great time for her. Kids didn't even jump in with her, so she had the whole pool to herself yesterday. Got to enjoy a relaxing pool for three hours. So, but I'm glad she got, she deserves a little break because of all the things she does. But I hope you got to get out and enjoy it. And, you know, yesterday, I'm, I'm pretty sure I saw pictures of Jay enjoying his birthday yesterday. And so, but we do have some uh, birthdays uh, to celebrate this week. Um, and, and, and we have actually four birthdays on here. So let's see, uh, the 14th. It's Michael's birthday. He's going to turn uh, 36, I think. So I remember, he's going to be 36. He's almost an old man. Almost. Not quite yet, but he's getting there. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, on the 16th, Roger. Roger has a birthday. I'm not going to tell you how old he is because I don't know. All right? Uh, also, Emery Nickerson has a birthday on the 16th, and the 17th is Ellie's birthday. So let's see. Happy birthday, at least, to Michael and Roger this morning. Your special announcement. 
No, you're doing that Bible yeah. verses later. Come on, we're, we're not doing things out of order because you're, you're coming up here twice. They just going to see you twice. So Ben wanted to share something with you guys. So go ahead, Ben. Well, it's not me really, but so Jessica and I had the ultrasound and we're having a boy. Woo! Did you come in blue? Why didn't you come in blue? Uh, blue. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. We need more, I don't want to say that. <laughs> say we need more boys in this church, but you know. <laughs> we need more young men and men as well. So, all right, well our call to worship this morning comes from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. And Susan, you've done it again. You've done it again, or I should say God has done it again. Uh, I, I, I just love how God put, puts everything together without us even communicating. She sends these to be Sunday night. And it's like perfectly aligned with what we're going to be talking about today. But 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 5, says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power unto the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. And that's the hope we hold on to this morning. That's the hope we want to praise God for. So let us stand together and say to God be the glory. <laughs>
comes at this time to read the scriptures. In order. In order. I hope so. So this morning, we are in 1 John 1, 1 through 2. And it says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it, and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, and has appeared to us. Thank you. Uh, no, no, read chapter 2, verse 2. Oh, you didn't quite catch the email on that. Well, I was wondering what you meant. <laughs> so you want me to read all, all the way down to chapter 2, verse 2. All right, we're going to keep going. <laughs> we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with his Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light, in him there is no darkness at all. If we proclaim, if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from sin, all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. My dear, my dear children, I write this to you, that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Amen. There you go. May God add the blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. All right, kids, come on down. Before you said that. I know, you were ready. All right, what? Yeah. 
Yeah, and so, I'll, you know, sometimes we think of the idea of what we're going to talk about this morning in church is fellowship and what fellowship is all about and getting together and having a good time. But fellowship is more than just that. It's about encouraging one another. You know, it's about helping one another. So when you get together with your friends, sometimes it is always about we hang out because we like things. We hang out because we want to help each other, right? We want to be right. Why do we, why do we come and gather to fellowship with all these people? Because they believe in God. That's right. Would you every day, would you Would you like to hang out with that guy right there every day? <laughs> Jeff, right there. Would you hang out with him every day? Yeah, I would too. Jeff's pretty cool. All right. Would you like to hang out with that guy right there? Would you like to hang out with Mr. Brett every day? Yeah. Go out on his boat every day? Get sloshed around by the water and the ocean? I don't know. I, I feel kind of sick. I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I can do that. You can go on a motorboat, but this is in the ocean. So, But we look around and say, yeah, we all believe in God and we should all want to be together. Right? We should all want to do things together, not just come together on church on Sunday, right? We should want to do things outside of church. Why? Because we all love who? What? We each love other. God. And God's love isn't just about what we share with one another here. We love each other. Yeah, we love each other. But God's love is supposed to pour out of here into our daily lives. And pour out of you into your friendships and pour out of you into your friendships so that who do they see? And Emmy, that's right. Who do they see, though? God. That's right, I wanted to see God. And that sometimes is hard to do because sometimes we get hurt or sometimes people might not like what we do or anything and they don't want to be with us because of that. So we have to overcome that by being Jesus. I want to encourage you guys, when you're building your friends, when you're hanging out together, don't just let it be about what, who, let them see you, but let them see Jesus so they can love God too like you do. All right? Just Hanukkah? Oh, that's cool. That's very cool. You should learn about that. And then let, ask him if you want to learn about Christmas. The real meaning of Christmas. Not just Christmas. No. Uh-huh. All right, well, I'm going to pray, and you guys are going to go downstairs to Children's Church. Oh, okay. What? Um, God is from we love You love each other? That's right. We, we are friends and everything, because we love each other. No. No, I got the end of that. We, we do things together because we love each other. And that's the most important thing. Right, Annie? Said, All right. She said that God loves us because we love each other. Well, God loves us in spite of whether we don't love each other either. But you're right. We love each other because God loves us. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah. All right, I'm going to pray. And then you guys can go downstairs to Children's Church, okay? <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the fellowship that we have that isn't just about what we like. But it's about you. And Lord, we can truly find encouragement and strength um, in life together. We can uplift one another. We can pray for one another. We can uh, be involved and engaged to help others, uh, each other see Jesus to be more like Jesus. I pray for these kids, Lord, that as they are friends to those in the school that don't know you, that their friends would see Jesus through their actions. And that they might, too, be compelled or want a desire to come and to know about Jesus uh, because of that friendship. So Lord, I pray you bless them and their family. And we pray. Amen. All right, as we turn our attention to our um, our prayer time this morning, I do have a couple of prayer requests kind of urgent this morning. Uh, Ruth is not with us this morning because after her uh, ablation procedure this past week. She has come home and she's still in AFib um, and very uncomfortable. Uh, they put her on her medicine yesterday. It was hoping to help, help it. It hasn't. So we need to be praying for that medicine to kick in as well as the healing from the ablation so that, that it will start working and she can regulate. So that is why she's not here this morning, but we need to be praying for her. Um, also this morning, we need to be praying for Fred and Debbie. I have got permission from Debbie to share uh, where things are at. Um, yesterday I stopped by uh, just so that we could mow their lawn for them because they'd be able to get to do it. And I went up to knock on the door and Debbie invited me in to tell me that yesterday they heard from the doctor that he has a blockage in his stomach. And that is why he's having so much pain. And they're not sure they're actually going to be able to operate. They're meeting, talking to the surgeon who did the original cancer operation to see if it could happen. But this, the doctor mentioned that she needs to bring in hospital. So his health is not very good. He's, the other thing is he's fighting it. He doesn't want help. 
He, does, he thinks he's going to be able to beat this on his own. So he needs to, to pray that God really humbles him to the point where he trusts in what God wants to do. And he helps and receives the care, not just for him, but for Debbie, because Debbie is very tired. And she's really trying to do all she can, but there's really nothing she can do. Um, the prognosis is if he, nothing is done with this blockage and it perforates, he will die very quickly. So it's a very serious situation, and we need to be praying for them, uh, sending them cards, loving them, whatever. I think Debbie could use all the encouragement in the world, so you know we need to be lifting them up in prayer this morning going forward. Um, I'm actually going there tomorrow to meet and pray with Fred and Debbie. So. Um, yeah, I also met with Dave and Gloria, and Dave is doing much better since his fall. Um, he told me what happened. It was very kind of a, just a silly little thing, but he lost his balance in the kitchen and went right down on the countertop. Uh, so his balance is, you know, kind of iffy sometimes. Um, Gloria is going to see a doctor this Tuesday to see about, Tuesday or Wednesday I think it is, to see um, about possible back surgery to hopefully alleviate the arthritis and help her to overcome the pain. Because many nights she'll, she won't go to sleep until 4 o'clock in the morning when she gets comfortable. So we need to be praying for um, Dave and Gloria as well. So. Are there any other prayer requests this morning? Megan. Um, I have a couple. Um, there's a couple that we used to go to church with they really need prayers for the wife. Um, their kids go to school with Grace, uh, but she just had a, an emergency surgery because she was hemorrhaging, and they said she has a big fibroid as well, but they can't operate yet because they could lose her during that. Um, they've got four kids, but she her asthma is so bad that she only has functioning between both lungs and she has degenerative disc disease so basically her two days at Walmart are really not feasible right now um, eventually she will be wheelchair bound because of it her back can slip out at any second um, but like I said their youngest I think is like two so they're in a spot where the, the older kids can help but it's still a lot on them um, uh, they are believers uh, and then my grandmother is supposed to be moving to rehab. They were set to move her on Monday, but then this weekend her kidney functions um, declined again, just very slightly. So it's not that the, they can't do it Monday, but they have to make sure her kidneys are at a point where they can move her. Um, but it's kind of like she just woke up from the encephalitis. Like she just. I saw her Monday this week and she was very incoherent and then the next day it was like boom, like miraculously gone. <laughs> so I know God's working there, but it'd be nice to have her closer. Alright. If you didn't hear if you didn't have trouble hearing that, um, the first prayer request was for her a friend of their a couple, the the wife had emergency surgery for hemorrhaging and they have a fibroid they can't get to because of that, as well as her <laughs> because of her asthma, she only has 20% lung capacity, and she has degenerative back dis, uh, disease, and she can't go to work and stuff. So just be praying for healing and strength. Um, for they are believers, so we need to be praying for the kids. I'm sure this is hard on the kids as well, watching their mother go through this. Uh, and for her grandmother, who's supposed to be moving to rehab, her kidney started not to work down, so just pray that that comes back. And we praise God that she's come out of the infection. So that's a... Uh, one step forward, two steps back, but it's moving in the right direction. We just continue to pray for healing there. Are there any others? <coughs> Brett. I have a phrase, 1930, little testament, you know, in the faith. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and, Oh, 
the mail on the doorstep, and uh, she had to pick it up. Uh, went down the, I couldn't get in, the door was locked. Uh, she always locked the small door too, so I went down Mary Skillings, and yeah, she found out that yeah, she had passed away probably weeks ago. She had gone weeks, and her mom would have gone. And also my brother Jeff was going through a, a lot of things being in the Tufts Medical Center. The latest is he had a mini stroke that affected uh, from the spine area. There's also some type of an infection in his body now that uh, they can't seem to locate. Running that high feet or drained his stomach, it drained his bladder more than 40 ounces of fluid and they had a no effect. And there's a lot of other things that's going on in the body. We really need that prayer. All right. Yeah, I want to pray for both of those. <laughs> Carol? I would appreciate continued prayers for my son's health. Carol's son's health. For Aunt Laura? Yes, Megan? Uh, just praying that the referral to Boston actually goes through this time for my his thyroid because um, his specialist said he no longer knows what to do and they've been going through this for too long. So. All right. I'll pray for Michael's referral to go through so we can get down and maybe get some answers on his thyroid. So we'll be praying for that. All right. Well, let's turn our attention and let's join our heart together and let's uh, pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for just the uh, privilege we have to come together to worship you, to come into your presence, to come boldly before the throne of grace, to pray, Lord, uh, and lay before you our supplications, our intercessory prayers, our just desire for you to, to help and to move in a mighty way in the lives of others around us, to bring healing, comfort, strength, salvation, <clears throat> hope, rescuing, whatever they may be, Lord, we lay them down and we ask, Father, that you would work in a way that would glorify you, that we would see your great name uh, just to be magnified as lives are changed this morning, and particularly on this morning as we remember what happened uh, on that day uh, in 2001. Lord, when we were taken off guard and, and the towers were struck and, and lives were changed, Lord, and the, the, the country was changed. But Lord, we don't want to forget what happened in the lives of those that rushed in, those that went in to, to rescue and save, and those that went on beyond that, the military, and the efforts, Lord, uh, going forth from that. We don't want to forget the, the lives that have been given or the lives that have been impacted, Lord, and the cancer. And, and to think, Lord, how grateful we are that we know that you are in control, even in spite of the horrific actions that took place on that day. Lord, many good things have come out of that. Uh, but Lord, we pray right now for the, the families that still have to live with the memories, still live with the scars, still live with the, the, um, the health impact it has on them with the cancers. And Lord, that you would uh, be ever faithful, ever true if you know you are. We thank you for just the, the reminder it is to be vigilant, Lord, to constantly remember to cry out and seek you, Lord, because we do live in a dark world. We do live in a world, Lord, that is um, bound, uh, Lord, for destruction and judgment. And you've called us to be the light in that world. May we shine bright. May we shine strong. May we shine, Lord, and persevering and enduring until the end. May your love be magnified and glorified. May that which, which has saved us, that which has brought us hope and peace, glow even brighter, that others would be compelled, others would see the hope, the peace, the strength that we have found in the fellowship with you, that they can find those very same things in spite of all that happens in this world. And this morning, we, we have all these requests, Lord, so many people impacted uh, uh, health-wise that, that need you in their life and their heart to feel you. Uh, Lord, that they would experience your presence in a new and, and great way that would provide the peace that passes understanding, hope and strength, healing. Lord, that they would trust in your work in your hand. 
this morning. We pray for Ruth as she's had this ablation. We pray for healing in her on her heart, uh, but also, Lord, with this AFib she's gone into afterwards, which is uncomfortable, we pray that you would, uh, the medicine would kick in and, and bring that in a, back to normal, normal rhythm and that she can uh, heal from this uh, procedure and, Lord, that it would correct the problem. I know that she's been dealing with that for such a long time, so we lift her up. We pray, Father, that you would just be with her and strengthen her this day. We pray for Fred and Debbie, Lord, and, and Fred's situation just seems to be getting bleaker and bleaker, Lord, as this cancer is taking over, and now he's dealing with a blockage. And Lord, we pray that you would just help him to rest in you, to stop trying on his own and to, to rest in you, and, and Lord, trust in you, and, and Lord, that the, the care that's being offered isn't a bad thing, it's to help him, and to help Deb as well, that he would think of what she's going through. So Father, I ask right now that you would bless both of them, you protect them, you bring healing and strength to Fred's, to Fred's body, uh, Lord, to his mind, Lord, for for Deb and her healing as well, because she is just physically tired. And Lord, if she deals with her own physical ailment, so I pray you bring healing and strength to them. I pray that we as a body would just help them in this time as we are, you know, carry each other's burdens. For Dave and Gloria in the same boat, Lord, we pray, praise you that Dave is healing well. Uh, we pray for Gloria and her back, that uh, this procedure, this surgery might be beneficial to her to be able to... Um, be able to get back out and not be in pain and be able to sleep and rest. And, and Lord, I know she misses desperately, Lord, uh, being here with her, her church family. So I pray, Lord, that you would just bring that healing. Pray for Megan's uh, and Michael's, uh, this couple, you know, this wife, Father, who's got it for emergency surgery from hemorrhaging, and her physical condition with the asthma and the degenerative disc disorder in her back. And Lord, being able to, to deal with this. We pray for whatever's caused this, this, this uh, hemorrhaging, that you would heal it. Uh, we know that uh, they are believers, so we lift them up and that their faith would carry them. We pray for the husband, the kids in this time, that you would strengthen them uh, as uh, the uncertainty, I'm sure, can bring doubt and worry. I pray, Father, that you would be their peace and their sure hand in this time. We pray for healing in that. We think we praise you for the good word on Megan's grandmother, that uh, she's come out of this infection, but also, Lord, she's had this setback. We pray that you will not keep her from moving to rehab so she can continue to get better, that this will just be a small uh, blip, Lord, and we just pray that you would just uh, bless the, the family in this time as well as they, they trust in your time of time process. Lord, we we think of all of our lobstermen in this church, Lord. We think of the situation they are facing, how, how um, uh, Lord, it could impact their livelihood, the livelihood of so many. So we pray, Father, for intervention. We praise you for Brett and the Gideons and the, just being able to give out those 1930 Bibles because we know your word is faithful and true and it will not return void. It will make an impact, a lasting impression. And Lord, we thank you for Brett and not all the Gideons as they went out there, Lord, for their faithfulness to be able to do that. And for the opportunities they had for conversation and, and to be able to share the gospel. We pray for Bud this week as he prepares for knee replacement. We pray that you would just to guide the doctor's hands so that everything would go smooth. And Lord, that his recovery would be um, quick and his healing uh, full that he would uh, be able to get back to the things I know he enjoys doing. Pray for Gina this time as well as she uh, cares for him, that uh, everything would go well. Uh, Lord, we pray for um, the, the Wyman family, for Beverly Wyman. There's, she's been, it's been brought to the attention that she's passed. And Lord, we pray for the family. We think of Jay's brother Jeff, Lord, right now, and all the situ health situations he's in down there in, in Boston. We pray, Lord, that you would just bring healing to his body and recovery to all the issues the minor stroke, the infection, and the doctor would find it. Lord, uh, just all the other things he's dealing with. We pray for your comfort and strength to be with him, that he would turn to you and look to you in this time. We pray for Carol's son and his health, or whatever's going on. We pray that you would just intervene. We pray for Aunt Laura. Lord, we just lift her up and pray you just continue to strengthen her. And Lord, that this referral that Michael's received to go to Boston to figure out what's going on with this thyroid, that that would be... Uh, go through and he'd be able to get down there and they can get some answers finally, Lord, to what's causing all the issues, Lord, with his body. That they would be able to find a solution and uh, be able to get back to doing the things I know he misses in, in the ability to do. Lord, we thank you just for the fellowship we have to be able to come together to share these requests and knowing, Lord, it's not just about us praying together here, but we'll take them home and we'll pray for one another because we love one another. We have that love because of that which we have with you, the fellowship we have with you. So, Father, I ask right now that our fellowship would be strengthened in, in the bond of, of peace and, and unity because of you. And this morning as we open your word, your Holy Spirit would guide us to be the people 
that we need to be to strengthen us, Lord, that we would have a fellowship that is like no other, that others would see it, and Lord, that it would compel them, draw them, because you are the focal point. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, if you have your um, Bibles, 1 John chapter 1 um, is going to be our main text. Now, this, I am not going to exegete this passage. There are so many truths in 1 John chapter 1 that, I mean, doctrinal truths that we could get to. But uh, I'm really going to focus on just one of them today and kind of pull out the highlights of kind of the, the, the underlying theme, really what John is talking about in his whole uh, epistle. And one day we're going to get to this epistle. We're going to go through it because it is so rich and so important for us to, when it comes to how we fellowship and how we live as the body of Christ. But because of, we're doing a series on building healthy community, we're going to talk about gospel fellowship. We've talked about the gospel foundation, what the gospel is, what it means to us. We talked about the gospel last week and the importance of it to our lives and daily lives. And we're going to talk about the impact or the implications of what the gospel is bringing, gospel fellowship within the body of Christ. And so, you know, we establish that the gospel reveals, that it reflects, that it rings out, that it rescues, because the message was Christ died, was buried, and rose again, and is manifested, as we saw last week, in the lives of in our lives as we live by its supernatural transformation that takes us from being dead to being alive. I don't know about you, but I don't think I've ever been able to take something that's dead and make it alive again. Try. For the sake of my kids. But I just don't have supernatural power to take something, an animal that is dead and make it alive again. All right, Or attach body parts back together or anything like that. The work in the church is supernatural. It has to be supernatural if it's going to be impactful. And so I want to really kind of talk about that impact, that this gospel we, we, we know has brought us into a right relationship with God, but more than that, it has created a new community of faith that is unlike any other. Yet, far too often, church, all right, what we call the church looks more like everything else, or is built and established, and is thriving without the gospel. We build ministries that thrive without the gospel. We build uh, programs that thrive without the gospel. We build community that thrives without the gospel. Why? Because we focus on certain things. Why? Because we believe community is important. I mean, God created us to be together, didn't he? I mean, what was the one bad thing God said in creation? That Adam, it wasn't good for Adam to be alone. I mean, the only bad thing about creation was, oh, I looked at Adam and goes, it, that's not a good thing. We've got to put him together with something. We created woman. I mean, relationships is God's idea. It's his, his bringing that we to be in a community of faith, that we be communal, communal together. It is the heartbeat of society. It is the heartbeat of our existence, of our living. We were born into community. We thrive in community as we build relationships with others, mostly with others who have common interests like us. Truthfully, we, we usually hang out with people who are more like us. I mean, they have the same interests. Or if you're a sports fanatic, you usually hang out with sports fanatics. You don't go and hang out with, with um, um, book nerds. Mm -hmm. All right? Book people. Typically, it's just the way it works, right? I mean, that's just, just that's how I do You're a fisherman? Guess what? You hang out with fishermen. That's just the way it works because you spend your time together. I mean, I, I don't go hang out with a mechanic because I'm not mechanical. They start talking about shop and stuff in there, I'm looking at going, uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, whatever. Whatever you say, I, I do not understand anything you, you just told me. All right? It's kind of like the old Charlie Brown commercial when the teacher starts teaching, you know, wah, 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 wah. All right? But we really, community, we, we try to think, I'm going to hang out with these people because we hang out a lot. You know, we, we have common interests. But that's not really what community is all about. And in the church, sometimes, it's impacted in, in large because... We've allowed what culture has, what we do in culture, to impact how we do church. As I'm not saying these are bad things, but think about all the, that we build in the church. The ministries are built upon similar life experiences, similar identity, similar causes, similar needs, similar social positions. Think of when you build a ministry. We build a ministry focused on youth or children or young marrieds or seniors. So these are all bad things. But when we forget about the fact that we all need to be together and fellowship together as one, and everything is more about this ministry or that ministry rather than this ministry, we lose out on the most important aspect of gospel fellowship. 
And that God has brought seniors and young people together to be molded together, to grow together, to impact each other. See, the seniors that should want to invest in the young people, the young people should want to look to the seniors for help and direction because they've lived life. And in the church, we're supposed to be about, we're supposed to not just be about seeing each other on Sunday morning, but it's during the week. I mean, if you go to Acts chapter 2, what was the one thing that stands out about the new church? They broke bread how many times a week? Once a week? Every day they broke bread and were praying together and being together. Now, I know, I understand, we all got jobs to do and we can't be together every day, but there should be something about this body that wants us to be together. That whenever the body gets together, we should want to be there. Whether it's a prayer meeting, whether it's Sunday morning, whether it's Sunday school, whether it's a uh, uh, ministry opportunity, a service opportunity, an outreach opportunity, we should all want to be there because we want to compel others to see who? Jesus Christ that has transformed us. And they'll know we're his disciples by our love for what? One another. See, a lot of times our fellowship, even in our conversation, is superficial, it's surface level. And John really gets to the heart of what true gospel fellowship is about. And I want to I want to talk about is we're going to build a healthy community that is biblically based, that is gospel centered. We have to look at what what is the basis of our fellowship together. Truthfully, our basis of fellowship is because of the gospel, because of Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. That's what brings us here. We have fellowship with God Almighty. And we come to do it together. So as we look at God's Word and see what gospel fellowship is all about, John points out some very important truths for us. And like I said, I'm not going to do full justice to this passage because we could spend uh, you know, a couple of months just in this one chapter talking about all the, the, the big things. But I'm going to point out just four simple truths for this morning that impacts us as a church. All right. So, verse 1, That which was from the beginning, that which we heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, uh, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. Who's the word of life? Jesus Christ. The, li the, the life appeared, we have seen it, and we testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. We don't just testify to tell you some truth. We testify because we want you to have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with Him, the, the great God and Almighty. So the first thing John points out is gospel fellowship's invitation. This isn't just a fellowship to go watch, to you know, go down to the local, you know, the local hangout and watch the football game this afternoon at 1 o'clock. Right? To watch the Patriots play Miami and probably lose because they always lose in Miami. As much as I don't want them to lose, just to, it's just a, a matter of fact because they just don't like playing down there for some reason. But anyway, that's, that's not the point. But typically we'll go somewhere, we'll hang out for a little bit, and then we go, and that's it. John is saying this invitation is, is, is reassuring and, and is a foundational truth that we can hold on to. And that gospel truth is this. They're proclaiming the gospel. They're testifying to Christ's resurrection, this eternal life that has been promised, opens the door to fellowship, not only with the apostles or other believers, but with God himself. We invite people to into fellowship with us because we want them to fellowship with who? God. It isn't about just hanging out with Pastor Ari, because he's pretty cool. Talk to my kids, they'll tell you totally different. No, it's not about coming and hanging out with me because I have, you know, the best wife in all the world. She cooks the best foods, you know what I mean? Best pie in this side of in the whole country. All right? It's, that's not a we. We want to invite people to come to fellowship with us so that they can know what fellowship is like with God. So the question is, do we have right fellowship with God? In order for us to invite them in, we've got to be in right standing with God. We have to truly believe that, which means we more than say, yeah, I believe Jesus is God. We show it. We live it. I mean, think about it. the end of this verse is great. Verse 4. We write this to make our joy complete. What is it that makes you joyful most? It's interesting when, when people get together and they have a good time. Oh, that was such a great, we had such a good time, we laughed a little, we had a good meal, that was great. But their joy was complete because people came into fellowship with God. That was where their joy was. 
It wasn't just in having a meal together. It was that they had fellowship with God. I think so often when we get together, we leave God out of the equation. When we fellowship together, we get together for a meal. Where is God in our conversation? When we get together at our houses, you know, we're having a good time. But as brothers and sisters, do we stop and take some time to reflect on what God has done this week? To share with one or to testify about those things? Pray together. See, the ultimate fellowship's invitation isn't just about getting together. It's about fellowshipping with God. This fellowship is not just knowing about or about a one time when we came into a relation with God, but it is a daily, lifelong fellowship that cannot be lost. You can never lose your fellowship with God. See, we may lose fellowship with one another because one of us may move away. One of us may pass on or, or graduate to the, the better life. That's why I want to look at it now as believers. We graduate to a better life. But God's fellowship with us will never, ever be lost. That's the ultimate fellowship we can give to people. And here John is inviting them, which we've heard, which we testify, which we touched, which we saw, this eternal life. We are inviting you to fellowship with us because we want you to have fellowship with God. Why do we want people to come to church? Is it because we want the church not to pass away? Is it because we want the seats to be filled? Is it because we don't want the church to die or because we don't want ministries to die? If those, those are all great things, but if that's the end of our thing, then we've got it all wrong. We want people to come to church so they fellowship with us because we fellowship with God and we want them to fellowship with God. It isn't about filling these pews or pews of other churches. It's about inviting them to know God and how much He loves them. That's gospel fellowship. That's what our fellowship should be about. Our fellowship should be built around our desire for people to know God more intimately. See, the invitation to the gospel in the gospel isn't just about joining the church, but being united with Christ. Look what Paul Paul writes. I mean, here's John, who was dearly beloved of Jesus, but Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 4 to 9, he writes these things about fellowship. He goes, I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Jesus Christ. For in him you have been enriched in every way, with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. God thus confirms confirming our testimony about Christ among you. See, the confirming of Christ is the transformation that's taking place. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here it is. God is faithful, who has called you into what? Fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. God is faithful. He's called you into fellowship. Hey, the sons of, I, I don't want to just hang out here one time. God wants to fellowship with you every day. And that's the invitation. That's the fellowship the church should be presenting is that we are in fellowship with God Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And we should want to be in fellowship with one another. Why? Because we're encouraging each other to be in fellowship with God. You know, it's one thing to have joy of seeing someone you haven't seen in a long time. But do we have joy in seeing each other every week? Do we have joy in seeing each other every other day? Would we have joy in seeing each other every day? Would that be so bad? Could you imagine seeing Pastor every day? I can make it happen. No, I can't. My schedule's too good. <clears throat> But really, why wouldn't we want to get together? Because we should want to come together because what? God is with us. We're two or three together tonight. There I am in your presence. When we gather together, who is with us? Man, it's a, it, that should be our joy is that we get together and God is there strengthening us so that we can do the things that God wants us to do. That is what gospel fellowship is all about. It's inviting people to be fellowshipping with us because we want them and desire them to fellowship with God Almighty. The question is, do we fellowship with God every day? Do we struggle with that? Do we spend time in His Word? And I know we get busy lives, and even as a pastor, so many things going on, sometimes I forget to read my Bible. I have to catch up on my yearly Bible reading. 
But I try my hardest because I want to spend time in fellowship with God. I want Him to speak to me because I know I need. I know that I'm going to sin. We're going to get to that here at the end of this passage. But truthfully, here John says, we write this to make our joy complete. I mean, the joy, their joy is complete because others are in fellowship with God. Is that what makes us truly happy? Is it just seeing each other or that we fellowship with God together? That's why we should come out. I mean, that's why we should make it a point to be together. You know, have people in our homes. Invite our neighbors over so that they can learn what fellowship is all about with God. Secondly, we see right here, not only is there an invitation, but John writes about gospel fellowships walking. Starting in verse 5, it says, This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have what? Fellowship with one another. The key to our fellowship is who? God. God is light. We walk in the light. Who are we walking in? We're walking in Christ. Walk by, Paul in Galatians says, walk by the Spirit, not according to the flesh. How many of you struggle every day walking according to your flesh or walking according to God, the Spirit? Every day. Some mornings, I don't want to get up. Six o'clock rolls around, I'm going to take this. Oh, man, I enjoyed sleeping till seven. I haven't done that for years. Well, of course, I don't do that anymore anyway, because the kitty gets me up at quarter to five, at quarter to six every day. Anyway, but... I mean, truthfully, you know, we, we all have the flesh we have to fight off, our own desires, our own wants. And here, here, John says, this is the message. God is light and there's no dark. God is perfect. He is holy and right and just. But if you claim, which Paul, John is recruiting uh, false teachers in the church, if you claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, he's saying, if you claim to be a believer, yet you live according to the ways of the world, you do not show any truth to the transformation of the gospel, the light's not in you. The light is not in you. But if you walk according to the light, see, it's like you have fellowship with one another. You see, if we're followers of Christ, and we're walking in the light, our desire should be for one another. That's our walking. Our, our fellowship, our, our everyday walking is the fact that we don't want to be in the dark anymore. We want to walk in the light. We want to be instruments of light. Look what Paul writes again, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 and following. It says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Baleo? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What argument is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God, and God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of a reverence for God. Now, this doesn't mean that we don't interact with the world, okay? This means that we just don't hang out with the world on a daily basis. As in, you know, we go and do the things that they like to do. We hang out with others who are in the light and invite them to come to see the joy we have in the light. You know, I know, I know a lot of, as a youth pastor for 20 years, kids were always caught in that, that way between the excitement and the, and, you know, this is so much fun and entertaining over here and this is so boring and, and you know what, it's really, really boring. It's what it is. Church is boring. People are boring. But when they go, what they find out is that moment of that lasting joy the world has, it leads to destruction. It leads to a life that is depraved, a life that is, that is worthless. Oh, well, not really worthless, but in, in cast aside in, in essence. Because everything that at one point had joy loses that joy because it becomes boring. I see it in the kids when they're playing video games. They'll play, oh, this game's so cool, it's awesome. And after about, you know, I, I, you know, it's, it's funny, after about six weeks, eight weeks, oh, this is kind of boring after a while. And, you know, this is the game, is, which is why these video games have every, like, four months, they do updates, and they, and, and they make the season more better because it brings them back in. They have to do that because they get boring. But you know the cool thing about God is you don't know what to expect. 
There's nothing boring about serving God. There's nothing boring about walking with God. And we're supposed to be like this is this is about community and fellowship. This is what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be separate from the world and living together. Gospel fellowship walks is walking in the, and that of Christ in his life. It is walking worthy of the gospel. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27. Let me get there. Philippians 1, 27, he writes, Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. How's our walk? Ephesians chapter 4. The church is supposed to walk in unity. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bonds of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. We're called to one. One fellowship with God Almighty. And we're supposed to walk that way. It is this walking, not just our talking, in the light that demonstrates the gospel. You know why so many people believe that church people are hypocrites? It's because they say one thing and they do another. And yes, we are hypocritical. There are many times when all of us could claim to be a hypocrite. But the difference should be we're willing to admit it and seek forgiveness for it. Because we want to walk in the light. It is the supernatural work of God in our hearts and minds that leads us to walk in the light of Jesus. In the light. God is light. God wants us. He draws us to the light, and He wants us to be the light. Actually, He says in Matthew, He just went and preached this this past spring. You are the light of the world. Not you might be, or you will be one day. You are. Not only that. Our walking is to be together and being built together according to Ephesians chapter 2 verses 19 and following. If you read it, we are being built into a building where he dwells and all his holiness encompasses it. This is why we walk in the light that others may see and come and be a part of something far greater than what this world has to offer. I mean, how many times do you get those ads on TV, join this club or join this card because we offer these benefits or come see this and we'll give you this free. I mean, it used to be in the day they used to call the resorts the um, the uh, timeshares would call you, come get a free weekend away, and we'll tell you all about our timeshares. And uh, you know, make, get you to make a bad judgment. <laughs> all right? That's what my grandfather used to He used to take, when I was a kid, he used to take us to those presentations just because he wanted the free stuff. He never got it because he knew it was a bad idea, but he still wanted all the free stuff. But think about it. We don't peddle free stuff. We declare a free life. Eternal life. The question is, as we fellowship together, as we think of our community, are we walking in the light as he is a light? Are we being a light to the world? And if we're not, I love this. Verse 8 goes to the third point here about gospel fellowship, and that's gospel fellowship's confession. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we what? Confess our sins. He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim that we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. Here's the truth. The, the, the confession of, fellowship, of gospel fellowship says we sin. We have a God who forgives us if we confess and repent and turn. That's, that's the beauty of the fellowship we have with God, is that he looks at us, even in our sinful state, still loves us, and he knows we won't be perfect until we go and receive our eternal bodies. This is the confession that we have. Our fellowship with God is, is that it, it, when it's broken, He offers a way to fix it. Just like He brought into us into our relationship, He continues to strive to make us more like Him. <clears throat> it is this confession that leads us when we do sin to confess and repent. It is this confession that leads us to understand the idea of restored fellowship so that, guess what? When my brother or sister sins against me, my desire isn't to hold it over their head. It's to go and restore our fellowship. Why? Because according to Ephesians 4.32, it says, Be kind and tenderhearted to one another, forgiving each other as what? Christ has forgiven you. 
Now you know your heart. You know your mind. You know your life. Have you been forgiven much? Much more than you deserve to be forgiven for? We are called to forgive in the same light as Christ is forgiven. I mean, think about it, what the psalmist says, that God takes our sin as far as the east is from the west. So I remember when I first heard that, I was like, no, that can't be that far. You get on the, the globe and you try and keep going east, spin around, you're going to, no, you never stop going east, do you? So I tried going west to see if I could find east. If you go west, guess what? You're going to go west and west and west. Sorry, the world's not flat, okay? Like some people say it is. It's interesting how God said as far as from the east is from the west rather than north and south. Because if you go north, then at some point on the earth, you're going to end up going what? South, eventually. When we go east or west, there is no end. That's why God didn't, says what he says. So think about that. Our, our sin is taken as far as the east is from the west. It's remarkable. John is writing to encourage us to see how this fellowship that we have now helps us to live in a way that is not ruled by sin. But he also underscores that when we do sin, we have an advocate. Verse chapter 2. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate in Jesus Christ who stands before God and says, Here it is, I died for that sin. Yep, I died for that sin too. I died for that one. You know, he's going to sin tomorrow too, so I died for that one as well. You know, next Thursday at 4 o'clock, he's probably going to say something stupid to his wife. I died for that sin too. Think about that. God died not only for my past sins, but my present sins are the ones I don't even know I'm going to commit. That he knows I'm going to commit. That's the fellowship that we have with God. Why would we want to lose that? Why would we want to forsake that? That's what Gospel Fellowship Confession is so much about. It's about admitting that, you know what, I am not a great person, but God is a great and faithful God, and he loved me, and I want to be like him. I mean, James writes, if you go to, if you go to the end of James in chapter 5, it's interesting how he even writes about this. Verse 13, is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. There's something about confessing our sins to one another. It isn't about, you know, bringing, you bring judgment on me. It's about having a brother I know or a sister I know that, it, that I can go to and say, hey, man, I, 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 I've done this. I confess this. Pray with me that I don't fall into it again. We pray for one another. Now, this isn't when we go, go to one another and we just lay out a laundry list of sins to one another. That's not what he's talking about. There is some power in the fact that we have each other when we're struggling with a particular sin. That we need each other. As a church, do we offer that to one another? And lastly, this is this is what helps us, you know, when we talk about this confession and when we do sin, we have this advocate. Verse 2 is gospel, gospel fellowship's atoning. Verse 2, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for our sins, but also the sins of the whole world. You see, our fellowship is not founded on our similarities, but upon the supernatural work of, work of Christ who atoned for our sins. And not just for ours alone, but for the whole world. And thus, we are to be actively inviting others to join us in this fellowship with the Father through the repentance and faith in the work of Christ. You see, because of Christ's atoning work, go back to the beginning, this which we had from the beginning, which we heard, which we testified to, this eternal life, this hope. We invite you into our fellowship, and our fellowship is with Christ. It's this circular writing here. He's saying, because of what Christ has done, we invite you into a better fellowship than what the world offers you. That if they find out what you're doing, they may cast you aside. God will not. But it's not just about us. It's about the world around us. We can only do the things of God because we have been atoned for. We can only do what God wants us to do because of the work of Christ. We can only love one another, serve one another, help one another, bear each other's burden because of Christ's atoning work. This is what gospel-centered community is built on and lives out. It is not about us. 
is about Him. We are to be different in the breadth and depth of our community. It is not based on, on our likes, our interests, but on Him. For in Him we've been given so much. Everything we do, from our youth ministry and our Olympians ministry to our nursery, all the way to our seniors helping seniors, should be based on fellowship in Christ and inviting others to know Him. Sunday school, everything we do, it's a community of faith that wants to glorify and magnify the fellowship we have with God the Father. You see, if we want to be the community of faith that honors and glorifies Him, then this is our foundation, the gospel. Not our programs, not our plans, but Him and Him alone. We are to build gospel community is a total commitment and surrender not to the church or the ministries of the church. It is a total surrender and commitment to Him and Him alone. It is a deep desire to dive deep and wide in our love for Him. To understand, as Paul writes, the breadth and the width and the height and the depth of love, the love of Christ for us. That those around us would see we are not like the world, and our community is built on His love, not ours. We do what we do because the gospel calls us to it, and we are all committed to it. It is not about what I can do, but what about he, what He can do in and through me, no matter my limitations that I think I have. It's commitment to Him first above all things. This is gospel fellowship. A deep desire to be together because of what Christ has done. Question for us in application, does the world around us see our desire to be together and follow his word in our lives by all we do? Does the community around us, does the, the people that we know and have we grown up with in this community, in Phippsburg and in that, do they do see our desire to be together and follow his word in our lives and all we do? Are we inviting each other into, our, into each other's homes? Are we inviting others into our homes so that they can see the gospel of God in us? See, gospel fellowship isn't just about meeting here on Sunday morning. Gospel fellowship should, should be entwined in all we do every day and connecting or praying with or praying for one another. As I close this morning, I'm going to flip to Acts chapter 2. I just want to read this. Because when the, new, when the first church was birthed, this was the reaction to the gospel. Those who accepted the message were baptized. About 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, fellowship of the gospel, to the breaking of bread and to prayer because of the fellowship. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Doing what? Praising God. And enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Because of the supernatural transforming power of the gospel. They wanted to be together and eat together. And God added to that. It is a supernatural work of God. This building, what happens in here has to be a supernatural work of God. It's to last. It has to be. Which means we have to be on our knees praying. We need to be devoted. I mean, that idea of devoted, I mean, we need to be devoted to one another. That is gospel fellowship. Not just to see how your week was or what happened this week, whatever, but hey, let me share and testify what God did when I read this and how He brought it up at this conversation or in this thing that happened in my life. Hey, I'm going to, you know, uh, go to one another and say, hey, can you pray for me this week? I have an opportunity to talk to someone because they asked me about Jesus. Is that the kind of community we want to be? Yes, it should be. My job as your pastor is to equip you for the work, that work. But not only my job, it is all of our job together to do that work. They ate together, praising God, enjoying favor with all people. We want to build a healthy community. 
We want to impact our community around us and the world around us, which isn't very healthy right now. It starts with our health in here with the gospel. Is that why we want to be together? Because we fellowship with God Almighty. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word. And Lord, and just scratching the surface there in 1 John chapter 1, but the, the highlights of that, Lord, is that our fellowship with one another is because of the fellowship that we have with you. And every time we get together, not only do we fellowship with each other, but we should be fellowshipping with you and praising you, praying to you because of the gospel. And that this world would see the light of the gospel in us and through us because our desire is for you to be made much of in our lives and through our lives. Help us, Father, to be that. That every day we would see the importance of why we get together. It's not about you know going to do this because I should do this, but because... I desire to be with others who are like-minded, to have fellowship with you, that others may come to know you. That should be why we do our ministries. Oh, Father God, I pray that you give us that heart, you give us that unity, that faith, that desire to be a church that is alive by the supernatural working of God in and through our lives, that helps us to do things that we weren't even think we're capable of because the Spirit is the one doing them. And Lord, we pray for our community. It needs the light. May we be that light now. For you name we pray. Amen. Please stand. We'll close with him. Five men that Jesus is Lord of all.
Lord, may that be our strength. May that be our unifying voice. May that be our hope and our peace to present to this world what the gospel brings. Not only does it bring salvation, but it brings sanctification, the ability to be in the light as you are in the light. Help us to walk that way, to love that way, to live that way. I just pray as we go into our meeting that you would help us, Father, to honor and glorify you, to seek the direction you want us to go. Which name we pray.